faster in technology, you know? <laughs> All right, and it's still facing the wrong way. Well, praise God. There we go. All right, so we spent a lot of time talking about these other guys, but we didn't talk a lot about what happened within the Catholic Church itself. Because even with the Reformation, Michael, Catholics still were the dominant percentage of Christian believers in Europe, and they, even to this day, still are. And as you can imagine, the church didn't really enjoy what was happening so much uh, during the period of the Reformation. So we know that when Martin Luther nails his 95 theses to the door, we have a guy by the name of Clement VII, is the Pope, in Rome. Clement VII was a guy who was born as, let me make sure I get his name right, uh, Julio de, de Medici. The Medicis were a very rich and powerful banking family that was living in Venice, and essentially, uh, Mr. De Medici was the second of the De Medici popes, and both of them bought the papacy. Both of them basically bribed away, because remember what happened back here, they became, the popes became the head of a very large uh, state, and so they saw this as a way to exert political influence, and so what better way than to assume the papacy? The church had become very corrupt by this point, and there were a lot of cries from within the church against the Domici popes. If you remember, we talked one week about a guy named Savranelli, who was also, he came from the city of Venice, where the Domicis were from, and he too was burned at the stake because he was a good Catholic man who called out the corruption of the Domici popes. Um, and he also predicted that there would be a guy who would come and rise up in Germany, a wild boar from the forest, uh, would come and reform the church since the church refused to reform itself. Well, Clement VII, the Domici uh, Pope, he dies, and um, a new guy comes to the papal throne by the name of Paul III. And History will look back at this guy and will see him as one of the good guys. Now, he was obviously very anti-Protestant, very firmly set in his ways because you don't become the head of the Catholic Church unless you really are a, probably a good Catholic. And so he had no love at all for Luther or, the, or Calvin or Swingley and certainly not for Henry trying to get a divorce, so he starts his own church. Um, well, anyway, he becomes pope in 1534, and as soon as he ascends to the papacy, Kendrick, he realizes just how corrupt the Roman Curia, that is the cardinals, the college of cardinals, is, how, how much corruption was within the church. And so he attempts to call a church council in 1536, just a year and a half after he becomes pope, he decides he's going to take on the powers that be. And you got to remember, who elects the pope? Who elects the pope? The cardinals. Now, what is, you don't get appointed pope. Now, you can bribe enough people, but Paul was actually elected. And a lot of times, the cardinals would remind the popes, hey, you owe me. I put you in that position. But Paul was not willing to be bought. He was a man who actually had character. And so he wants to call a council, uh, basically, for the reform of the church. But the Curia, Peggy, isn't going to have none of that. They oppose him and say, go have a seat, Pope. We're not having a council. Nothing's going to change. You just go be Pope, and we're going to do our thing over here. But he was persistent. In 1537, he issues a papal decree, which he didn't need, because again, remember in the Latin church, Pope has some supremacy rights. And so he issues a, a paper, which I'm going to butcher this, it's in Latin, Casilium de Amendada Ecclesia, which basically started calling out many of the same abuses some of the reformers 
had been calling out. Yes, sir? So he was more of a puppet. Uh, he was not. Yeah, he, they tried to make him a puppet, but he was not. Because, remember, he wanted to call a council. They said no. We were not going to go along with that. So instead, he issues a papal decree and basically spills a lot of their secrets out into the open. Because don't mess with the man who knows where the bodies are buried. Mm. Right? And so Paul was willing to name names and name bishops who had concubines and secret marriages and had children by mistresses, all while parading around and demanding clerical celibacy from the priests. He also called out um, uh, rampant abuses with regards to um, uh, finances and uh, bishops who were bribed and, and, and known for bribery. Later that year, he also had enough of what was happening in the New World with the subjugation of the Native Americans. And so he issues another decree, which didn't earn him any uh, brownie points with the royalty of the day. It was called Sublimus Deus, and he stated, Indians are human beings, and they are not to be robbed of their freedom or their possessions. Now, that might seem like a duh to us, but that was a pretty novel thought at the time as the Spanish conquistadors were coming into the Americas and basically robbing the Native Americans that were here of everything they had and plundering it and taking it all back uh, to Spain and to Europe. Now, he did also, because he, so we talked about some of the good he did, but let's also be very clear that he did also, was very instrumental in the founding of the Society of Jesus, otherwise known as the Jesuits. Now, the Jesuits today, if you think of the Jesuits, you probably think education, right? And that was a big part of their mission. They wanted to educate. But early on, part of the mission of the Jesuits was missionary activity. And by missionary, that, including, that included the use of force to force people to convert to the true Catholic faith. Now... We've learned a few things through time. Can we be fair about that? All right. We've learned you can't bribe people into being Christians. We learned you can't force people to being a Christian. You can't torture people because they might be willing to say it out of their mouth, but they're not going to be really true Christians. Let's give Paul at least some benefit of the doubt. This was still modus operandi of the day. And to be fair, the Protestants were doing the exact same thing. When we start talking about this period and the Counter-Reformation, often the thought is from the Protestant side, oh, those horrible Catholics persecuting those Protestants. But the truth is that in prominently Protestant countries, the Protestant reformers persecuted the Catholics to the same degree. They also tried them. They also burned them at the stake. They also um, confiscated their property. Uh, and both sides, both the Protestants and the Catholics horribly persecuted the Anabaptists. The Anabaptists, both sides believed that were worthy of a third baptism, because the Anabaptists baptized a second time, and so they said, well, since they love to be baptized, let's baptize them a third time, let's just not bring them up. Right? And so this was, so there was a lot of this religious violence that was going on. Anyway, this, uh, the Society of Jesus was founded by a guy named Ignatius of Loyola. You've heard of Loyola University. It was founded by the Jesuits in his honor. Uh, and he's got a really interesting history. I would encourage you to go read, uh, go read about him. I, I think you would really enjoy it. Anyway, in 1545, Paul finally gets his wish. And by the powers of the papacy, you can appoint bishops into the curia and so he had enough bishops appointed into the into the roman curia that they finally agreed to hold a council and it's known as the council of trent what is interesting about this much to the objection of many of the bishops and priests uh, pope paul invited martin luther john calvin and other protestant reformers 
as well as Eastern Orthodox to come and to attend because he saw this as a church-wide issue which we needed the whole church to discuss. Now, Martin Luther and John Calvin didn't quite trust the Catholics because we remember what they did to Jan Hus. They invited him to come to a council, promised him safe passage, and still burned him at the stake. And so Martin Luther and John Calvin uh, said, mm, I'm going to take a hard pass on that. It's a no from me. We're not going. One wonders what influence potentially the reformers could have had had they attended this council. Because you've got to remember, especially for Martin Luther, Martin Luther never wanted to form his own church, never wanted to break away. They're called reformers for a reason. They wanted to reform the church. And that's why even to this day, the Lutheran service is not that far off from what you see in a Catholic church. He was not trying to make a massive split from the Catholic church. And so, anyway, they, re they said no. Anyway, this council goes on for 20 years. You think, now I, I, went, I grew up in the Baptist church, and we had a committee for everything. And we talked about everything, and we voted on everything, and we could never agree on anything because we had so many committees. Well, these guys, it took them a long time to agree. It's one of the longest-running councils in church history. It runs for almost 20 years. And it took them a very, 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 very long time to agree on anything. But by the end, they did agree on a few things. First, they upheld the structure of the church. They continue to believe, they have reaffirmed their belief in the supremacy of the Pope, they re reaffirmed their belief in bishops, and they reaffirmed their belief in uh, priests not marrying. Uh, they also rejected all compromise in matters of doctrine. Remember, what were, can you all remember some of the doctrines that they had big, the Protestants had disagreements with the Catholic Church on? Name any of them, yes. Doctrines around Mary, right? So they, uh, the Protestants did not necessarily believe Mary should be revered, but not to the extent that maybe in the Catholic Church. What's another one? What was another? Salvation by, by faith. All right, salvation by faith without work. Remember, that was Martin Luther's big thing. The Catholic Church came back and said, yes, but faith without works is dead, so we're not going to agree with you. It's salvation by faith and works. Now, to us nowadays, you look back at this, and I understand fully what they're saying having come out of a Pentecostal background. Because as Pentecostals, we also were taught salvation is by faith through Jesus Christ mm -hmm. only, and is evidenced by good works. Faith without works is dead. My salvation is by faith, but I give evidence with my works. Basically, that's what they were saying. Maybe not in quite the same words, but that is the essential of the doctrine. But So they rejected Martin Luther's theology. They rejected the idea of baptism by immersion. They rejected the idea of baptism for adults. They rejected uh, a whole host of things, and they stated emphatically, this is what we believe, and you know what? I think we probably would look kind of funny at them if just overnight they suddenly changed all of their beliefs, because that would mean they never probably really believed it in the first place, right? So, uh, so they stood by their convictions. However, they did, they did listen to the reformers, and they used the exact same language of the reformers, to condemn corrupt bishops and priests. They forbade the selling of indulgences. Uh, now, you could still get an indulgence, but you couldn't buy it. It was wrong to, to sell any sort of a thing, any sort of a church benefit. Uh, they also uh, forbade the idea of clergy enriching themselves upon the backs of the laity. 
They required better education and oversight for the clerics. If you messed up, you weren't just protected and stuck away in a convent somewhere or stuck in a monastery. You'd be defrocked and thrown out on your rear end out of the monastery. Go earn money like an honest person. Um, they also no longer allowed uh, a bishop to not reside in the territory where he was because what they were doing is they would buy, if you wanted to be like a major, uh, a major uh, bishopric might have been like in Cologne or in Prague, but maybe you didn't want to go dwell with those barbarian Germans or Czechs. And so as a good Italian, you could go before, you used to be able to just go walk into the Vatican, pay some money, congratulations, you're the bishop, and you never had to go to Cologne, you never had to go to Prague, and you never had to take on any pastoral duties. And so they said, that's not right. A bishop is supposed to be a pastor's pastor. You're going to go and you're going to do your job, or you're not going to be a bishop. Um, the, harshest, the harshest thing that came out of the Council of Trent was they didn't quite learn their lesson from back here in 1054. Because remember, they didn't just excommunicate the Eastern Church back here. Remember what they did back here? They anathematized them. They condemned them all to hell. And so, here in, six, in 1563, in the final document that comes out of the Council of Trent, they have a whole 50 points of the various things that would get you anathematized and basically, it was every Protestant doctor. Anybody who believes this, anybody who believes this, anybody who believes this, anybody who believes that, anathematized, anathematized, anathematized. It was like Oprah handing out anathematizations. One for you, and one for you, and one for you. Look under your chair. You're all anathematized. Right? And uh, now, we laugh about it, but it led to some pretty serious consequences. Because in 1546, during the middle of the Council of Trent, they also re-accelerate what is known as the Inquisition. Now, we've all heard about the Inquisition. You've probably heard of the Spanish Inquisition. But the Roman Inquisition starts in 1546. And basically, this was to go and to take those who had erred in their faith. It was largely geared against Protestants who had left the Catholic Church, but it was also geared against Jews and Muslims, anybody who thought differently. Uh, and uh, so they persecuted them and all of the various things that happened. Again, to be fair, let's just go ahead and say it, Martin Luther, John Calvin, none of them have clean hands in this because they did the same kind of stuff even some of the early Anabaptists, as we talked about during the week of the Anabaptists, they also engaged in this nonsense. This is where we've talked about the good and the bad. This is the ugly, right? It's amazing how bad people can be. The Inquisition had been around since the 1250s, guys. It had been around at this point for about 300 years. And... They would torture, put people on the rack, or they would hoist people in cages to the tops of churches and leave them there to starve or burn them alive. The, the, the witch trials were very common then. And of course, we know that even some Protestants took this all the way into the 1600s uh -uh, right here. The Puritans remember the Salem witch trials here in the Americas. Even so much that the Roman Inquisition pronounced Galileo, a heretic, in 1633 for the audacious claim that the earth revolved around the sun. And it wasn't the sun revolving around the earth. He was excommunicated for that. Um, in 1562, we have the bloodiest period that happens at this point. And it's known as the French religious wars. It first breaks out in Catholic France against the Huguenots. The Huguenots were part of the reform movement right in here, and uh, uh, they wanted to stamp them out. Remember that in France, Calvin was a Frenchman, and so re the reformed faith 
had more down in France than anywhere else. And so the French royalty, with the permission of the church and with the backing of the Jesuits, launches this war against the Huguenot peasants, and hundreds of thousands of people died. The Holy Roman Empire steps in, wanting to destabilize France. France, therefore, then launches these same wars to go forward within the borders of the Holy Roman Empire. And so you have now Catholics, Protest uh, uh, Reformed, and Lutherans all fighting with each other, murdering each other in the streets, all in the name of Jesus. Isn't that crazy? Um, it finally gets settled. It takes them quite a while. It takes uh, 36 years. And they finally come to a settlement. The end of the conflict recognized two acceptable expressions of Christianity in France and in the Holy Roman Empire, but only two. There's one problem. We've got one, two, three, four, but it only recognized two. Basically, if you, if let's say Tristan was going to be the new king of Bavaria, he could choose which religion his subjects were going to be. He could either pick Lutheran or Catholic. Nothing else. You can't be anything else. If you were anything else, you were still a heretic, and you were still, if found, going to be burned at the stake or baptized for a third time. Right? And so this is the settlement that they come to uh, there in 1698. It doesn't hold very long because 20 years later we have another 30 years of war break out, this time within the Holy Roman Empire. And remember, at that point, the, the Roman, Holy Roman Empire was much bigger than France, had a larger population. They also had the same four expressions. And so war breaks out there because the Germans, which is the Holy Roman Empire, kept messing with the French. The French kept messing with the Germans. Some things never change. And so France egged on this war. It breaks out. And 30 years later, they come to the Peace of Westphalia. And there they decide that from now on, there would be three acceptable expressions of Christianity in the Holy Roman Empire and in France. And those would be Catholic, Lutheran, and Reformed. We're not going to put up with these Anabaptists and the Church of England. Well, y'all just stay up there in England. Leave us alone. All right? This was, uh, this was quite something. Now, at the same time, in England, we have the War of Roses happening. Nice, nice sounding name for a war, but the War of Roses was essentially religious wars between the Protestants and the Catholics in England. And they're also fighting with each other. Finally, in the end, the, uh, the Protestants under the Puritans win, and they actually succeed in a period for about a year, there is no British monarch. It's ruled as a theocracy by the Puritans, and they're finally, there's another little war that breaks out, and they are run out of office, the monarchy is restored, and the Puritans are now on the out. They're no longer very, uh, shall we say, welcome in England. So what to do? I got an idea. Let's get on a boat. Let's go to America. <laughs> Come into America. Y'all don't even know who that song is. Neil Diamond, right there, y'all. Go Google them, you'll figure it out. <laughs> anyway, so they, they come to America, and of course we know that America is largely settled by Presbyterians and Puritans, and there's also a lot of these Anabaptists come over there. The Anabaptists largely settle in Pennsylvania. Catholics largely settle Virginia and Maryland, Virginia being for the Virgin Mary, Maryland for Mary land, and the Presbyterians largely settled all of the rest of New England. And it was those pesky Presbyterians with their ideas on the separation of church 
and state that finally one day had enough, had a little tea party, and declared their independence from the British crown. And so they began this great experiment in democracy that we know as the United States. It's why I told you several weeks back, if there had not been a Protestant Reformation, America would look very different than it does. Anyway, let's get back to our Reformation. In 1806, another circumstantial event happens. Founded in 806, right down here, where the Pope of Rome crowned the first Holy Roman Empire in 1806, a little short Frenchman by the name of Napoleon conquers the Holy Roman Empire and a thousand-year empire comes to an end. Holy Roman Empire is dissolved in 1806. In 1868, they have another council for the church. There had been calls in the church, hey, you know, what are we going to do with all of this stuff? Because the Protestants are kind of on a rise again, and the church is kind of stagnated, and we really need to solidify a few things. And so they call Vatican I. The Roman church calls for Vatican I. And again, they invite the Protestants and the Eastern Orthodox to attend. That's a pretty big thing, Chris, considering that they have essentially anathematized all of these people and condemned them as heretics to hell. But they have invited them to come. Surprisingly, none attended. Uh, they did, however, establish it was a major win because there's a battle within the church at the time between the very conservative side that wanted to reaffirm the Council of Trent and a more progressive side that wanted to embrace the thought of the Enlightenment and humanism and some more of the Protestant ideals that had really become commonplace in the world. Because, I mean, face it, Europe in 1868 is very different than it was in 1568. And uh, instead of softening their stand, they took a little bit of a harsher stand, and this is where they finally said as official church dogma the concept that when the, when the Pope sits in the chair of St. Peter, he speaks with infallibility. That his decrees, when he writes a papal bull, when he issues a proclamation in his office as Pope, it is an infallible statement. It is not to be questioned. And to question the statement of the Pope in that moment is an act of heresy in and of itself. So not quite the step that the people who are wanting to bring the church more to the main line of Europe wanted to see. By the time we get to 1870, we have another thing that happens. Remember where the corruption of the church started back down here? By the creation of the Papal States, where the Pope becomes the head of the state? Well, in the 1870s, as Napoleon is defeated at the Battle of Waterloo, you start seeing the formation of the nation states of Europe that we know today. In 1871, what was left of the Holy Roman Empire comes together and they form the German Reich. And down in Italy, Italy finally unites all of the various little principalities and kingdoms come together. The Papal States are dissolved and the state of Italy is created and the Pope basically goes into hiding inside the Vatican and does not, cannot come out because he is a wanted man in Italy. In uh, that last, that way from 1870 until 1931, when a nationalist fascist dictator of Italy by the name of Benito Mussolini that says, okay, enough Pope, you don't have to hide any longer. I'll tell you what, 
if you will grant some legi your legitimacy to my regime, I will create, I will carve out of what is the city of Rome, a small area housing the Vatican, and it will become a sovereign state in and of itself. The Pope said, deal. And so we had the creation of what is now known as the world's smallest nation, an area no greater than four city blocks, the Vatican, or the Holy See becomes its own standalone nation, far lacking the kind of power that they had when they were the papal states. Um, let's fast forward a little bit more to modern, because I have just covered a period of about 400 years, 500 years, in a matter of about 45 minutes. But Jesus' great prayer, let's make sure we look at, we, we talk a little about scripture, because it is church, right? What was Jesus' prayer back in John 17? Father, that they might be one, even as you and I are one. And here is something I've learned a long time ago, Michael. When God has a plan, men can stand in opposition to the plan of God. Not everything that happens is God's will. Amen. However, God uses all things together for our good so that in the end, His will is accomplished. And so, by the time we get to 1962, we have a, I believe it's Pope John at the time, I, I don't have the name, I didn't type it out here. Uh, Jay could tell, because he is a Vatican scholar, he knows this stuff in and out. And we finally have some, um, we finally start seeing some reconciliation starting to happen. There are still forces, if you, uh, if you have Catholic friends, they will readily tell you that there is some division within the Catholic Church to this day, where the very conservatives want to go back and reaffirm all of the stuff from the Council of Trent. And there's others who really affirm what happened at Vatican II. John Paul, it wasn't John Paul II, it would have been the first Paul. Yeah. Second wasn't until the 80s. Anyway, in, uh, in Vatican II, the Pope, for the very first time, cancels the anathematization of the Eastern Church and urges the full restoration of communion with the Eastern Rite churches. Basically, he says, the whole reason we split was stupid. It was a bunch of ego on both sides. We shouldn't have excommunicated y'all. Y'all shouldn't have excommunicated with us. We should allow to grow together what belongs together. Now, uh, there still are some differences between the Orthodox Church. They enjoy fellowship, uh, but they do not enjoy full communion with each other. By full communion, I mean if you are a Catholic, you cannot go to an Eastern Orthodox service to receive uh, the Eucharist and, and vice versa. However, you can easily attend each other's services. Their, their bishops uh, have, uh, have conferences together, and the Latin Church recognizes the apostolic succession of the Eastern bishops, and the Eastern bishops recognize the apostolic succession of the Western bishops. That is a huge deal. They were unexcommunicated. Now, why was this such a big deal, and why does this make a lot of the people who want to go back to the Council of Trent unhappy within the Catholic Church? Because one of the stated dogmas of the Church had always been that the tradition of the Church, including what the popes say and what the councils say is equal to the scripture. Is that still the official dogma? Yes. However, with Vatican II, basically they put a little bit of an asterisk on it and said, but we can be wrong. 
right? And think about it. How is that any different than what we see happening in a lot of Pentecostal Protestant churches where they put the prophetic word on a very high level? Somebody gives a prophetic word, and man, that's what God said, and we're just going to follow what God said, and then it turns out that ah, that's not what God said, and then they have to go correct themselves. So, again, I want to make sure that we put it all into proper context. Then, probably the biggest, the biggest of all concessions. Now, they, uh, they did not, uh, they didn't restore full communion, they didn't even urge full communion with Protestants. But remember, they, they condemned Martin Luther as a heretic, John Calvin, a heretic, Jan Hus, a heretic, at Vatican II, the church, the Pope and the church apologized for what they did to Jan Hus some 500, 600 years earlier. And then they wrote, with regard to Protestants, quote, our thoughts turn first to those Christians who make open confession of Jesus Christ as God and Lord, as the sole mediator between God and men, to the glory of the one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We are aware indeed that there exists considerable divergences from the doctrine of the Catholic Church concerning Christ himself, the Word of God made flesh, the work of redemption, and consequently the mystery and ministry of the Church, the role of Mary in the plan of salvation. But we rejoice to see that our separated brethren look to Christ as the source and the center of church unity. Their longing for union with Christ inspires them to seek an ever closer unity and also to bear witness to their faith among the peoples of the earth. And with a simple vote of the Vatican II, they lifted the excommunication and the anathematization of millions of Protestant Christians. Can you go take communion in your church? No. But are you a brother or a sister in Christ? Yes. All who call upon the name of the Lord, is their sin now, shall be saved. And we'll let God sort out our differences. It encourages also ecumenical dialogue with the separated brethren in Protestant churches, recognizing them as, quote, full brothers and sisters in Christ. What do we learn from this? All of this was to learn something. Now, we learned a lot about where we came from, how we got here. But remember what we started out. If we ever want to try to bring all of this mess back together, it's important for us to understand where they all are. What do they believe? What happens so easily is that, and we see this, and especially if, if I can take a slight detour, we see this in our society today in politics. We just demonize the other side. We just say, well, they're just the devil. Those liberals, they're just devil devil liberals. They're just double, double, double. they're just double devils. And those or, or those Republicans, they're so awful and terrible and demonic. And you know what? You get nothing out of that. You only diminish your own position in saying something to that effect. We learn a lot more when we listen to each other and we understand where people stand. Because in the end, when you look at all of these various little branches with all their little labels, you know what these guys believe in? They believe in Jesus. And these guys over here, they believe in Jesus. And so do they, and so do they, and so do they, and so do they, and them, 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 and all of the thousand little other twigs that come on the thing. They all look to Jesus Christ as Lord. We need to get to the point where we state emphatically there are some essentials upon which we must agree. The tree which binds us together. We all come from the one vine. Jesus' name, Jesus' blood, Jesus' word, Jesus' spirit. Those things there can be no compromise on because they are essentials. But all of the other stuff... We can let God sort that stuff out. Right. Because how dare we think that we know the dogmatic truth, Michael, to absolutely everything. Some of these branches still believe that they know it all. And they're going to get to heaven, and they're going to realize they didn't have it right in the first place. 
I find it humorous, even in the affirming circles, how many of us want to establish dogmatic denominational cliques and go back to all of the same denominationalism that we wanted. Out of all of these branches, remember which one I said I aspire for us to follow in the greatest, to the greatest degree or to, or to look like? It's these guys here. Because their whole point, the Anabaptists, simply were, we're not worried if you're a Catholic, we're not worried if you're a Lutheran, we're not worried if you're a Calvinist. We just simply want to follow Jesus. We are in this world, but we are not of it. And we're going to do everything that is within us to be at peace with all people around us. God will bring all of this stuff back together. We saw with the outbreak of the Pentecostal revival up here in 1905, you know what we began to see? We began to see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit also among the Eastern Orthodox, mm -hmm. among the Anglicans, among the Catholics, all around this period, around 1960s. If you haven't heard of the charismatic renewal within the mainline churches, I encourage you to look that and what does God's Spirit do from the Scripture? He brings together. Satan divides. Holy Spirit brings together. So as we look at all this, I just want to say, look how God used all of these rotten, awful, horrible, miserably mean, cheaters, thieves, liars, drunkards. I mean, I could go on, right? But we'll keep it PG-13. They, they did a lot of awful things. But yet God used all of them. And through all of them, God's word continued to go forward. And we're here today because some of these guys brought the truth to our great, 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 it looks so quiet. I know this wasn't as juicy as the stuff with, you know, Martin Luther and his calling demons and stuff. But yes. She said that was a road. She said it was a road? Yeah. You don't like my tree? It looks like a road. It looks like a road? Okay. <laughs> yes. There is no capital of the Vatican. It's just, it's just the Vatican. So why is it called Vatican City? Because it's the Vatican City. That's what it is. The Vatican is Vatican City. The Vatican is the complex of buildings. The Vatican City is the, is the state. It's like Washington, It's like Washington, D.C., but much smaller. Much, 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 much smaller. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Very good. Next week I will do one thing on uh, uh, more kind of along this line. We talk about the cults next week. Because up here, in this little branch right here, these are the troublemakers right here, out of this little branch we get some really interesting groups <laughs> that branch off. And so we're going to talk probably uh, predominantly about uh, Jehovah's Witness and Mormonism uh, next week. And they all kind of come right out of this, out of this mess here. Not a mess, but they do kind of create a theological mess a little bit. All right. And then week after that, we're going to start reconciling our faith with who we are. And if you know anybody who struggles with being gay and being a Christian, we're going to open the Word and we're going to look at what the Bible really says about the subject so that we can give some peace to some folks who really believe the whole Bible is the Word of God. Very good. I've enjoyed it. And look at there. I made up for my two Wednesdays that I went over by five minutes by being under nine minutes this morning. This Isn't that good? Yay. I can never be accused of being long-winded again. <laughs> or maybe I can. There's still time. And just for that, Tristan, you no, can pray. I didn't say anything. Yeah, that look you gave me was enough. <laughs> I'll wait until you preach in what, three weeks, and when you get to about 30 minutes, it will be like...
<laughs> Flip the lights, turn your mic off. Pray, brother. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for this night and the coming together of us uh, to learn about our history, God, and to get into your word and to, to see the uh, struggles of the church and where we are today, God. Um, I pray for the coming back together of this church, God, that we realize that we are all one family under you, Christ. Yes, Lord. And that um, you just kind of uh, give us hope that, that we can still be a family, though we might argue we still belong to you, Jesus. Um, I pray for safe travel home tonight. I pray that everybody has a blessed, amazing rest of their week. Um, we all come together on the Sunday. So we really pray. Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful rest of your week. Safe ride home. See you Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. And you at 9.55. And you too. Uh, no. <laughs>